back up. Let it back up. Back, back, see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There is he. Yeah, yeah. That is class. A goal. Hi, listeners. It's Football Down Your Podcast 68. We're here to talk about Dutch football, the Eredivisie, the Dutch national team. I'm Michael Statham and I'm with Mike Bell. As usual, you're probably listening to us um, via SoundCloud, YouTube, iTunes or Football Nation Radio. We're glad to be back in 2020. We've got, you know, loads to talk about as usual. Thanks for sending in your questions via Twitter. Enjoy this podcast. Mike, there's uh, been a really good opening weekend back from the winter break in the Eredivisie. We are going to touch upon the Netherlands national team in just a moment. But the first game I want to talk about today isn't Ajax PSV a final. I want to talk about the RZ Willem Twe match. It was second against fourth, but it ended up with Willem Twe um, jumping up to third place to finish the weekend with a 3 1 win at title challenges RZ. What an exceptional result it is for Tilburgers, and what a, du- a dumping result it was for RZ because it, it knocked some six points behind Ajax now in the Eredivisie title race, just as they thought they were going to get into it. Seems like they're out of it. Yeah, um, it's disappointing in a way because you want a, a title fight, and as Ed were the only ones that were really going to challenge Ajax this season. And yeah, it's two results on the bounce now that have sort of knocked them out of it after they're playing so well. Um, I feel like, yeah, they just couldn't make inroads into the Villantoui defence. I mean, they're unlucky to hit the post twice. Uh, for Vindal and Stengs. But as the match went on, um, their centre-back pairing of Boytens and Vlaar, they got tired and um, the pace up front for Vellum too, it just proved to be too much. I mean, the second goal from Pavidis was just a killer counter-attack. They just got too much pace for them. And as soon as they got past one of their centre-backs, you know, the other one's too slow to catch up. So, yeah, I mean, what a result for Vellum too, but they've been doing that all season. They beat Ajax, they beat PSV earlier. It's been an absolute revelation and um, yeah, their attack is is great and um, you can't rule them out from finishing in the top three because yeah, PSV aren't doing it at the moment. Um, Fine order a bit shaky, so why can't Valentine have to keep this up? Um, they're not going to lose any of their players before the end of end of January, so yeah, there's no reason why they can't maybe challenge that top three spot. But yeah, I'm really disappointed in the way AZ started because I really really wanted them to to challenge Ajax. And after they took the lead, they just seemed to take their eye off the ball. Um, yeah, Bordeaux was invisible up front. He struggled to get into the game. And yeah, it's just a shame for them, but what a result for Villain to it. From an RZ point of view, I thought they had a, a fairly slick first half. Um, but then they, 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 they completely felt dropped off for the second. And... Uh, Villain Tway just uh, worked their way into the match and yeah, they sort of sucker punched them. But then by the end, they definitely deserve their win because of the amount of chances that they created. I, I think now it, it's a really important time for the Tilburkers to see how they how they can carry on this run and finish the season on, on a massive high and, and impress a lot more people. They've got um, Hill and Vayner in the, in the cup in midweek, which will be big, of course, for their season. Then a home games against Pexwalla and Hillicles. So that will be a test of whether they can beat the teams that they're now expected to beat before they then travel to PSV, which could be a big, big game in the race for second, third, fourth place. So, yeah, plenty to look forward to with them. And a player that really impressed me uh, in that game was, was Pavlidis, the striker, um, who's really becoming quite a strong target man type striker. He used to be an attacking midfielder. But since he signed permanently for Bochum in the summer, the German side, he's developed himself as a a, 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 a linchpin sort of striker, but also someone who is very good in the counter-attack. Sets a lot of players away. Very important for their team. But yeah, in addition to that, they've they've strengthened a lot of areas of their pitch. And I've also been impressed with Holman and Peters, their two centre-backs. That partnership's going really well as well. Um, so loads of positives for them. But loads of uh, poor points for RZ. I thought that Calvin Stengs was pretty sloppy. And if we're now going to keep, keep keep an eye on the Netherlands Euro 2020 squad options, two players last night who are in Ronald Koeman's full attention, Calvin Stengs and Myron Boadu, 
Neither of them had a night to remember. Stengs for me just tried too hard to do the right thing. If he just played the simple pass, the obvious one, I think we would have seen Arze create a lot more opportunities. But Steng time and again, uh, he, he just gave the ball away. And Boadu as well, I thought was pretty anonymous in that game. Another concern for Kuman with uh, Memphis seemingly out of the running entirely to get fit for the squad, although you never know. Um, and Daniel Marlon now expects to be out for the rest of the season for PSV. So he's surely the the one who, who has the biggest chance of getting into the squad and being first choice striker for, for Koeman. Um But yeah, I, what did you think about them, Mike? And do you think that this is just a little blip for RZ and they're, they're, they're Dutch, the star Dutch players? Or do you think this is now them sort of getting found out a little bit? I think everyone can have an off day. Um, you know, this will be on to his side. They're hard to play against. Um, you've got to give a benefit of doubt that Stengs and Bordeaux are both huge talents and have been great all season. They're allowed to have a few games where they don't maybe perform. Um, you know, the winter break's been full of speculation around them. They've both committed their future to AZ, which is great. You know, earlier in the day, you know, Stengs was getting linked to both Juventus and Barcelona. But if you know, after watching that game, then there would have been some doubts in their heads. Um, yeah, it's just an off night for both of them. I think Boadu, he needs the service from Adrissi and Stengs. And when that's not coming, then he can be a bit anonymous. Um, yeah, Stengs, you know, he's not the quickest of wingers. He, he likes to play the, the sensational through balls all the time. And sometimes they just don't come off and he... Gives away possession, but yeah, I'm just going to say it's a one-off blip for him and hopefully he gets back to top form as soon as possible because when they're in form, they're great to watch. And yeah, for me, they're two of the names that I want to see in the Netherlands squad. So I hope they, they get their form back. We had a question in from a page on Twitter that, that um, shares news about Dutch football in the Portuguese language. But he asked a question and said, RZ or Willem Tue, uh, who will make the Cinderella story or something close to that in the Eredivisie? So both teams are obviously having great seasons, but who do you think will be more remembered from the 2019-2020 season as being the revelation? Right now, your mind's got to be on Willem Tue because you know, nobody saw them challenging for top three. You know, they were maybe in some people's mind for a possible relegation at the start of the season and now they're pushing for a European spot. They've got an attack that on their day can trouble any defence, you know, not only Trezor and Pavlidis. Gotta say it's one of the most exciting attacks in, in Dutch football and yeah, I don't see why they can't, as I said earlier on, challenge for a top three spot and then if they do then that's just sensational. Um AZ you expect them to be around the top four. Um at the start of the season, and that's been proved right. If they had challenged Ajax for title and they could have won it, then yeah, that's a fairy tale story. But um, I can't see that happening now. So yeah, the two great stories, and it's great for Dutch football. These two teams are, are doing really well. And um, it's not just a, the traditional top three. I think um, the Willem Tway story right now is the, the more surprising one. Uh, I agree with you, Mike. So I think we'll move on. Uh, one of the questions was from S underscore Van Den, um, one of our regular people who send in questions to us. With the injuries up top for Aranya, do you think um, Yvara Dilrosan will be included in the Euro 2020 squad? I'm still holding out hope that Memphis will be fit and willing to come in June. So there's um, plenty of options in particular for the striker and uh, winger berth. So there's lots of competition there. Um, do you think Dilrosan is going to be uh, important in, in, in Koeman's squad decision or do you think he's going to be on the periphery? He's one of the wingers that's made a debut under Kimmin and he's obviously going to come into consideration. Um, he's dropped into under-21 squad, but we saw that fantastic goal. He scored the winner against England in a friendly, a free kick from about 30 yards out. Um, he's a regular for Hereford Boyn, but he hasn't been in outstanding form since come back from his, his injury. Then you've got to look at the other options that kimmin has got. So you've got Justin Clivert, who before he got injured was doing really well for Roma and he actually developed into a key player for them. So he obviously comes back into consideration. Then you've got Calvin Stengs, Bordeaux. And then the, the likely ones that are going to be in there like Ryan Babel and Quincy Promise. Kuman has a lot of options and it's just between now and the end of the season for these players to, to prove themselves. And that's 
going to be great for the Netherlands because they do have so many attacking talents, especially wingers right now, that have to prove themselves in the next few months. So they really need to perform. So hopefully we'll see their son doing really well in the Bundesliga because that's the only way he's going to get back into the squad because I think Koeman's going to see a lot more of Stengs and Vodou for AZ or Promise for, for Ajax. So Delroson really needs to, to step it up to come back into consideration. Yeah, I haven't seen a lot of Delroson, but looking at his record of goals and assists this season, you can't say he's been massively important for Hertha Berlin. Um, whereas someone who also hasn't played too much is Ryan Babel, but I'm sure he will be in Kuban's uh, squad, given his experience um, and his form actually for Daniel, because we gave us criticism in the past, particularly myself. But I think that now he's back at Ajax, he'll get plenty of game time and can be important. I think he'll look for the Europa League games against Getafe to really try and try and shine, um, given his experience. Yeah, but he this weekend made his third debut for Ajax, um, returning again. In a 2-1 win against Sparta. And my goodness. Ajax made hard work of that. Uh, their attack wasn't on its best form. Although it was good to see Quincy Premis back for Ajax. An excellent player to have in the Eredivisie. Um, no matter which team you support. Um, he's a joy to watch. But even though it was a good day for Ryan uh, Gravenberg. The midfielder. Um, who's only 17 playing for Ajax. Ajax did have their problems and Sparta created too many chances, didn't they, Mike? And it really, it should have been points dropped for Ajax. Um, and as confident as we are, maybe, that Ajax will win the title, it could have been points dropped and Sparta could have caused a big surprise. Yeah, definitely. I don't think Ajax were at their best today. But what I did like was that Ten Hag gave the youngsters a chance. You know, they had Sim De Jong and Hunter on the bench, but he went with... Ravenberg from the from the start. He brought on the Kellen Camp in the second half. He played a big role in the assist for Ravenberg to score the second goal. And then later on we saw Carol Eiting come in and Lasina Traore as well. So yeah, it was a youth, youthful Ajax side at times today. Um, they got the job done, but they weren't at their best. Um, Sparta really, really unlucky at the end. You know, Joe Pro but one back and then only a fantastic clearance by Alessandro Martinez we headed it against the post stopped it from being 2-2 and Onana had to make a great save for the end as well and we saw it in the Premier League yesterday uh, the Bournemouth defender Steve Cook who you know conceded a penalty and got sent off for handballing the ball over and that was a great save but Martinez showed how you do it by it was just an outstanding clearance and that's what's got Ajax to three points today um, yeah I think it was a sloppy match from them. It didn't help that Ziek went off injured and they'll be hoping that he's back fit um, as soon as possible because he's so important for them. I think they just underestimated Sparta a bit. You know, Tadic didn't have a good game up front. You know, Promise is just back from an injury, so he's a bit rusty. Yeah, the attack wasn't there. And at the end, the defence sort of took their eye off the ball a little bit. But they got the three points in the end and now they're six points clear, so... You've just got to say that right now they, they are favourites for the title and it's going to take a big blip from them from now until the end of the season to, to throw it away because they are the strongest sides in the league. And I don't think AZ, as they've shown this weekend, are going to win every single game on the trot. So yeah, I think Ajax, they won ugly today and that's the way they're going to win the title, I think. Unfortunately, you may be right, Mike. They have scored plenty of goals this season. I think they're still averaging four goals a game. Um, but they just aren't that convincing. The, what Ajax is the, their biggest enemy is themselves and their complacency sometimes. It's, it's been the same with them in the past. The other problem though today um, for me was the, the defence. I don't think that the centre-backs, I've said this many times this season with Ajax, and we had the concerns before it even started. We knew that when Matthijs de Ligt left, it was going to be difficult to replace him. But surely by having um, a taller centre-back next to either Joel Veltman or Lissandro Martinez, you can have someone who will win aerial duels against those big strikers. Today, um, Ten Hag went with Martinez and Veltman, and Martinez was targeted time and again by Sparta's two strikers. The, the goalkeeper, Harush, had a great game, by the way. Um, for me, was man of the match. 
he would always long ball it straight up to the strikers. And every single time Martinez would seem to lose the ball or try and win the ball, but then lose out to the physicality of um, Ragnar Aka, who's no small striker, but either way, an Ajax centre-back shouldn't be losing out like that so easily. And there are two other options on the bench, Perskurs and um, Edson Alvarez, the two big centre-backs who, Skurs, by the way, has been quite impressive for me this season. Not perfect, he has made mistakes. He made um, a vital mistake, actually, when Ajax lost to RZ 1-0. But Alvarez has been put in midfield as well and there's clearly a reason why they're not quite making the team. Ten Hag thinks that the others are better but can't, can't they train with having Perskers, um with perhaps Martinez to improve him because he will be the future of Ajax so why why not use him and, and play him? It, yeah, for me it's it, it looks obvious to just replace him but yeah, what do I know? Because when the man of the match was announced in the Amsterdam Arena, guess who was man of the match? Martinez. So, <laughs> am, I, am, I just, am I just sprouting stuff here, Mike, or have I got a point? <laughs> I think Martinez got it for that. No last gasp. Clearance off the line. Yeah, Sparta, Sparta did target him, and it's been a problem for Ajax all season. Their defence just hasn't been as solid as it's been in recent years, um, with De Ligt now gone. You got to worry that that's the biggest problem you saw in the Champions League, and you see it in the Eredivisie as well. They've been targeted and they, they give away sloppy goals all the time because their concentration just isn't good enough. And you got to worry that if they're going to win the Europa League, which they've definitely got the squad to do so and they've got a chance of doing it, they can't give away these stupid goals. Um, you know, the, the spot I won today was just so so easy as a long ball forward, Pro was just left and he just stroked into the net. It was, it was far too easy. And, this is what's going to cost Ajax in the long run in Europe this season if they don't sort this out. Yeah, Skurs for me has been impressive at times this season and yeah, he's the big man so he would be able to fill that role that Delix left. And it obviously doesn't help that Daley Blind's still out. Um, he's just returned to training. There's no return date given to him after his heart condition. So hopefully he's back as soon as possible. But yeah, it's just Ten Hag seems to like playing Veltman and Martinez together, they're not the biggest centre back duo, um, but it seems to be what Ten Hag wants to go with until they get found out too often or it's too late, he's not going to change it. Um, yeah, like again, they got lucky today because they got a win in the end, but it could have been so much different if Sparta had taken one of their chances at the end. You sort of answered uh, one of the other questions you had via Twitter, Mike, from Nick asking are Ajax good enough to win the Europa League because he's seen them play many times a season and as always with Ajax it's the defence uh, I, I agree Nick it, it is I don't think it will be it will be good enough to handle some of the the, the, the best sides in Europe attacking wise Ajax can, can give any team a tough ride but Ten Hag can't rely on that he, he can't say that the you know attacking teams is enough playing against Getafe away and at home he might have a have a good chance of getting past them because against a Spanish side, yeah, a lot of it's on the ground, and Ajax have a lot of good defenders that are good at the the duels one to one on on the on the floor and good at um, they've got good intelligence in interpreting where they can intercept the ball and so on. But it's when you come up against, say, you know, a German team or an English team, they're gonna have problems. I think we saw that already with RZ when they played against Man United. That the English team will have just have too much pace and power for a Dutch team. If they don't have that um, European style of defending in a European match, yeah, for me, you know, Ajax got so close to the Champions League last year, but they had a better defence and they had Frankie De Jong. And um, this year they're a bit different. And for me, the big worry is right now Ziyech is their their star man. Um, if he's out injured, then that's a big problem. But even up front, for me, yeah, they score a lot of goals, but Dusan Tadic has been more of an assist maker this year. I don't think it's it's worked as well as it had last season of him playing for the middle. Um, so goals will be also a bit of a worry against the bigger teams, if it's, especially if the front three is going to be, say, Tadic, Ryan Babel and Quincy Promise. Um, yeah, I can't see that really hurting some of the biggest clubs in the Europa League. I might be wrong, but I just can't see it happening. And yeah, defensively, they're always going to leak 
goals if you keep playing like they did today. Uh, I'd like to say that Ajax will get far so that it helps the Dutch coefficient. But we'll just have to wait and see because right now there's some doubts about the, the way they're playing. Um, and yeah, if CX out, then it's a big blow. It definitely would be if CX was out. I agree. Um, we're going to move on to some more Eredivisie news, Mike. It would be good to try and cover every single team before the end of the podcast, but as always, we know it's very difficult. One of the main talking points was VVV1, PSV1, uh, a return for Lee Catamol, um for VVV. He was captain today as well, back from injury. Um, the crowd sang his name at the end of the game because it was a good result for the Venlo side. Uh, but PSV, again, very poor. I didn't watch the match, Mike. Um, I'm going to go watch it later. But I know you watched it, and I don't think you were too happy with PSV, were you? No, they're absolutely horrendous to watch at the moment. It's it's mind-boggling how bad they are. It, it's, you know, they sacked Van Bommel, and I was a big critic of him um, getting sacked. And they seem to have written off the season because they've just brought in Faber until the end of the the campaign, I think they've just went, right, we'll finish maybe top three this year and then re restart for next year because Malin's out. So they've started just giving up on this. This year they're not going to win the title, they're not going to... They're out of Europe already, so they're just kind of plodding along until the end. And we saw that today, just the performance today was just garbage from start to finish. Um, you know, they don't have Malin for the middle, so they're trying to play with Steven Bergvine. We saw him do that before for Netherlands on the 21s, I was never really impressed and some people have touted him as a possible striker for, for Netherlands but I think he showed today that he can't do it. There's a chance at the start where he was put through clean one-on-one -on -one with a goalkeeper and he just fell over um, at a vital moment. He just doesn't have that clinical finish that somebody like Memphis Depay has and I really think that they're going to struggle for goals between now and the end of the season if Sam Wammers is coming back and he's looked very good in the winter break, he scored some really great goals in training. Apparently, looked really good. Um, so as he comes back and starts banging in the goals, and I think his PSV struggle, side's going to struggle before the end of the season to to win games. Just all over the pitch defensively, they were really poor again today. Boscaglia gave away a stupid penalty just for a rash challenge. Another try to get in Rodriguez from AC Milan. Hopefully, that will shore up the the left back position, but. It surprises me that they only think they need one signing this month because the midfield is is awful. Um, you know, I had to such a big talent. Other than him, they've got nothing. Rosario offers nothing. Hendricks offers nothing, and and Ryan Thomas. No, he's been out for a while, but he looks a shadow of the player he was at Pexville. And I don't really know if he's anywhere near good enough to play for this PSV side that should be challenging. You know, Ajax. I don't think he's a a title challenging type of player. He's like a more mid table range. I'd see him at a, a Vitesse or a, a Utrecht. That's his level. And I don't see how it improves because you know, I don't think young PSV at the moment have an abundance of talent coming through like, say, Ajax have or AZ have. So it's a worry for me that PSV have this side and there's not really much options that they've got to change it. So for now in the end of the season, you could say that PSV aren't the second best side, they probably aren't the third, and with Feyenoord coming back, who's to say they'll even finish in the top four? Um, for me, I'd be a, if I was a PSV fan, I'd be very worried right now where the club's going because I can't see them finishing top three now because they just don't have the players, the attitude or the, the coaching staff to get them through this. You know what this really feels like? Um, I, I know it was a good analysis that, Mike. I won't, I won't go over too many of those points again. Um, but it feels like the final for the last couple of seasons, very stale. And the rest of the season is going to be a write-off. I can't believe that the management of PSV have let it go this way, but they probably realise that there's no point spending money. There's no point spending money because it, it won't affect their league position. But they need to be chasing that second place and the Champions League qualifying spot. Unless now they have little confidence that any PSV side could get through those qualifiers it's difficult to get through the that route to the, the group stage of the champions league but they've got to be targeting that kind of position it's going to be a depressing ride i think now for psv fans and those that have to watch their matches between now and the end of the season which is a massive shame 
because again they were one of the most entertaining sides to watch. It I just don't know why, um, say a manager similar to Dig Advocate wasn't put in charge of PSV to the end of the season. Um, Ernest Faber is not going to be inspiring to the players unless he's there to bring through some of the younger players to the first team, which we haven't really seen so far. Um, and I'm surprised that they haven't managed to loan a striker as well. There's plenty of strikers around Europe at the minute. I've noticed that seem to be in need of a move. And yet PSV won't, well, I don't seem to be looking at anybody. But yeah, they, they're shoring up the left-back position. So Rodriguez might be coming in. Uh, and despite that, they've got Bustagli playing today at left-back. Why not give him an extended run in the first team? Unless they just have no confidence in him either. In which case, why is he playing today? So it's a mess. And it's going to be a long, um, say, well, six, seven months until PSV fans can be excited again to watch their team play. Or at least properly. Because it feels like now the rest of the matches will be sort of in vain. And there's going to be a lot of um, a lot of points dropped, I think. The thing I would put forward if I was in charge of PSV right now, in... Mexico, we've seen Vincent Janssen come back into some form. Um, he didn't play a lot towards the end of the season because he's injured. Their season's now over. I don't understand why PSV don't try and even attempt a little cheeky home bid for Vincent Janssen bring him back to the Eredivisie. He'd, play their, he'd be their main striker between now and the end of the season. Regain some form for Monterey. It'd be one-win for them. And if he scores goals from now to the end of the season then he could come into contention for the Netherlands national team. It seems win-win for PSV, Monterey and Janssen. I just don't understand why something like that wouldn't happen. Maybe a well before the end of the month if they come to the census but yeah that's one option for them but they just don't seem to want to take it because they've, they seem to think that Bergwijn is good enough and that uh, Troglu and Sam Lammers will come in the next few matches. Yeah, Sam Lammers coming back would, would be positive for fans. And it might give their season a lift. Uh, perhaps that's what they're waiting for. They're waiting for Lammers to come back, to put him back in the striker's role. Um, and yeah, he gets to extend the run in the first team. Yeah, And and you said already about Stephen Berkvine, perhaps not impressing in the striker's role uh, for PSV. I wonder if he's probably asked to play that role. Because even though he doesn't find it his favourite position, he might have asked to, because he realises there's a chance to play there for the Netherlands, but it, it's not it's not really inspiring anybody so far. Um, yeah, uh, and Mike, I, I was wondering if we could sort of quickly round up the rest of the area of Z this weekend. So um, one of the, the biggest games of the weekend was Final Three, Hill and Vey won. Um, so you think now Final are in, in a good position to be challenging second and third place again? For me, yeah, they're... Still unbeaten in the air division under Dick Advocati seems to have come in and done a good job. The main factor for them would be getting Jorgensen to start scoring goals again. He got two against here in Wien. So if he gets his confidence back and starts scoring, they've got exactly what PSV don't have, a goal scorer. So I can see them climbing further up the table between now and the end of the season, or fourth now. And I'd say that they're in a better position than PSV to challenge AZ for second. And what a surprise that is, given the start of the season they have with under the Yop Stam. Uh, the, another result uh, which saw the start of Edward Sterling's um, a, a appointment at Vitesse Arnhem, they won 3-1 at Virginia Sittard. Do you think that Sterling's a, a good option for Vitesse? Uh, he's, he's a club man, isn't he? But perhaps not the most ambitious of managerial appointments? No, I think it's another one like PS. We have done, have just went, right, the season's maybe right off now. We'll just bring somebody in until the end and we'll decide to to go for somebody more permanent in the summer. But he's, there's Cobble Edgend, he's got off to a good start. The Cobble will back him, I think the fans will back him. So yeah, it's a good start for him. He's got a good squad taking over. I think you've seen that Tim Matav's got two goals on Friday night. So if he regains his form, um, and yeah, Vitesse, it's a good appointment for them and I think they'll finish comfortably in the European playoff spots. Uh, another one involving a team in the Europa League playoff spots, uh, Peck Swallow 3, Utrecht 3. Um, Utrecht, they signed Jürgen Zut on loan from PSV to the end of the season. Is Zut going to be 
still in contention for Ronald Koeman's Euro 2020 squad because he was, um, for, well, he probably still is, uh, the number two choice um, once Sillison gets injured. But do you want a keeper that's playing for Utrecht and isn't playing that well at the minute playing for the Netherlands? No. <laughs> I mean, this season has been an absolute horrendous for Brazil. For and you've got to say there's, there's better keepers around right now. The worry for Koeman is that Tim Crow is coming through Norwich but they're in a relegation battle. Um, Jasper Sellison's not playing that for at the moment, he's their second choice. You know, he went there to be first choice, but he's he's dropped onto the bench. And then who else is there? Kenneth Mears just went to, to LA. Maybe by low before the end of the season, if he keeps a lot of clean sheets to fire, it might come into contention. But for me, the best goalkeeper so far this season in the has been Marco Bizot. So I hope he gets some more recognition and Hope he's definitely in the squad. Um, I'll take him over her own suit every day of the week. That's a good shout. I think Marco Bizzo should be considered second choice once he gets back into the RZ first team, um, currently suspended at the minute for his red card. Um, and as Pex Wallet, it's looking like they're in for a tricky second half of the season um, down the wrong end of the table. And I, I thought at the start of the season they're in for a positive campaign, but. You know, just keep having poor result after poor result, and John Sakerman's got his work cut out there. Uh, it's going to be a very busy end of the season for those relegation spots. So, for the first time this season, there is going to be two direct relegation spots, of course, in the Eredivisie. 16th remains a playoff spot um, against the teams in the Erste Divisie. And no one wants to finish in the playoff spots because most of the time you end up getting relegated anyway. So, the bottom three really could be in, in danger. Um, we can't speak too much about Arden and Hark against RKC Valvike at the minute because it's currently in play. But Alan Pardew's there um, in charge at Ardo, and I recently talked to Love Sport Radio about about Pardew. There's a lot of interest from from the UK, from England, about how Pardew will get on. Um, he's got a very positive and negative reputation amongst different fans, depending on what supporter you are. And Ardo fans are looking at some of the criticism he gets online, especially from West Brom supporters or Newcastle supporters. He does have a tough time. But I tell you what, he's not a bad coach. And surely he'll have that immediate impact at Ardo with all these, you know, his influx of signings he's got to lift him out of trouble. Yeah. Um, I know Pardew well being a Newcastle fan. Um, he did all right for, for us for a couple of seasons, but then dropped off. He wasn't very popular with the fans. Um, yeah, his, his personality, you either like him or you, you hate him. Um, I think we all remember that little dance he done during the Ethica final that made him a bit of a, a joke. But he's got a personality and I think that he's going to come into Adam Den Haag. You need something because they had an awful start to the season and if they didn't do anything heading into January, then they're one of the favourites to, to go down. But I think his appointment has brought some life back into them um, and I can see them staying up now. They've brought in all their own players from England, we'll see how they do. And Mick Van Buren, who's you know, a Dutch striker, has been around for a while, he's got Champions League and Europa League experience in the Czech Republic. So yeah, I think it's <coughs> a very positive appointment for Adder and Hag. It's, it's, it's a name, it's a big name as a Premier League coach coming in there. Yeah, I, I can see it going well for them. It's only a short-term appointment for Pardew. It gets his name out there again. If he can keep them up, then it's good for him and good for the club. So it's, it's probably a win-win situation for both of them. Yeah, the appointment just works, doesn't it, on so many different levels. And uh, Chris Powell is going to be Pardew's assistant. He could be the successor at Ardo if Pardew decides to move on. Uh, I think his hefty contract, I, I imagine he gets a big wage considering he's come down from the Premier League. That might well be the reason why it's a six-month deal. Um, Martin Yol is also there, the technical director, whatever fancy name you're going to give it. But he's also there, um, not on the training ground, of course. So you never know, he could be uh, back in the reckoning at Ardo as well, um, as manager in future. So it's it's a team of three very, very experienced um, men in football, and surely they will deliver. 
and then lift Arda back up to mid table, um, where which where they deserve to be. They deserve to be an Eredivisie club. It would be a shame if they got relegated. Although of course your reputation doesn't save you from relegation. It's how hard you work to get out of it. Um, and a couple more results in this weekend. It looks like Emmen are coming out of trouble by beating Hedekluis, and I think the less said about Twente Honingen the better because it was nil nil. But the second half of the season is looking like it will shape up to be a big relegation battle. Too many of those sides. Um, if you're going to pick three now, Mike, which three do you think are going to be in the, the, that bottom three? It's tough because there's just so many that are so average at the bottom. Um, I think RKC, I'd say they're going to finish finish bottom for me. I think that VVV um, they had a good result this weekend, but I can see them getting... Finishing the bottom three, and then oof. I'm going to say Fortuna Sittard. I'm not impressed by them. I think that they'll be bottom three contenders. But then if Pegs Vaux and FC20 don't shape up, I think FC20 have done really well to get Noah Lang in. We'll see how he does for them. But yeah, for me, if I had to pick now, it'd be RKC bottom, and then. It's not a bad choice. I think it's, it's one of those where. Uh, in a few weeks, one team will win a couple of games and it will look, all look completely different. I'm assuming you've predicted that already, Mike, with Pardew having an impact at Ardo and they escape the bottom three. I agree, though. I think Varvike will be bottom. Um, they don't quite have the quality to stay up, despite their good run of results. They had a couple of wins recently. Um, Twente should be fine. I'll be very surprised if they do end up in the bottom three. And Emin as well are putting um, some some good performances together to get out of treble. Sparta won't be in that in that. Uh, bottom three uh, towards the end of the season. Yeah, are you looking at Fortuna, Pex, Walla, VVV, Ardo, or IKC finishing in the bottom three? Yeah, for me, it's going to be IKC, Fortuna, and I think Pex, Walla will be 16th and VVV just above them. I think Peck will have to face a relegation playoff. They've had a few injuries, but they just haven't really clicked all season so far. Tough one. Um, Unless there's anything else you want to talk about, Mike, it's been a pleasure doing this podcast, first one of 2020, and there's plenty more to come in the run-up to Euro 2020. No, that's everything for me, yeah. Well, yeah, thanks for joining me, in, and thanks for everybody that's listening as well. Make sure you give us a like uh, if you're listening on SoundCloud or YouTube. Subscribe if you're new. Um, there's plenty going on on the Football Line YouTube channel at the minute. There's interviews you can watch. There's... Uh, build-up for Euro 2020 that's starting to be filtered onto the channel as well. But also on iTunes, if you're listening to us over there, make sure you give us a recommendation. Give us five stars if you really enjoy us. Um, it all helps the reputation to grow on, on that platform. Um, yeah, thanks for listening and more to come from us soon. That is back up! That is back up! That is easy! Yeah! 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 That is easy! Yeah! Yeah! That is Glasser! Goal!